Hello, everyone, and welcome to our NATEC COVID-19 webinar series. Today's topic is on vaccine hesitancy and misinformation, a sure timely topic as we're seeing uh, trucks of vaccine rolling out across the United States uh, to healthcare workers as we speak. My name is Shelley Sweethelm, and I'm a nurse leader at Nebraska Medicine and a subject matter expert and program director for the National Emerging Special Pathogens Treatment and Education Center, otherwise known as NETEC. So we're really glad to have you all join us today on this timely topic. We will uh, have Lauren Sauer, who's our director of our Special Pathogens Treatment Network, uh, provide an update uh, here shortly and introduce our speakers to you. We will follow our presentations today with a question and answer uh, time frame. And in fact, most of our speakers have uh, really made some very succinct presentations for you today so we can spend the majority of time on your questions. This is our mission statement for the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center to really increase the capability of the US public health and healthcare system to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspected and confirmed special pathogens. So when we say need tech, what need tech encompasses are four domains. One is assessment. So we have some self-assessment tools. Uh, we're defining metrics for end uh, user groups, uh, hospitals, uh, tiered system structures. And then we also in uh, pre-COVID timeframe did a lot of work with on-site assessments and hope to get back to that soon. In addition, uh, today's webinar is being brought to you by the education and training arm of NETEC. And we have typically prior to COVID done a lot of in-person courses and have transitioned to a lot more online learning modules as well as webinars, uh, given the difficulties with travel. We also have a very robust technical assistance arm. So feel free if you have any key questions to go out to the website and email us a question and one of our subject matter experts will get back to you. We also have a very robust online repository. So don't ever start uh, from scratch on a project related to uh, infection prevention and control and special pathogens. It's very likely that there's already a resource out there for you to just take, download and customize to meet your needs including exercise templates for um, tabletops, functional, as well as uh, full-scale exercises. And then we have a very robust research network uh, who's bringing you uh, today's topic um, that includes the ability for us to do uh, data capture as well as to quickly review um, available medical countermeasures and other sorts of uh, research components. So I want to turn it over now to Lauren Sauer, our Director of our Special Pathogens Research Network. Lauren? Thanks so much, Shelley. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us. We're thrilled at the turnout for this webinar and appreciate the incredible number of thoughtful vaccine-related questions that came through during registration. The focus for today's webinar is primarily around vaccine hesitancy and myths and disinformation. And while we won't be able to get to every question today that came through, including some of the ones on the chat, Many of the questions that have already come in are clinical or process oriented around the vaccines that are coming out now. So we are working on a follow-up vaccine Q&A series to answer many of these questions. So stay tuned to the NETEC website for more information on that. I'm thrilled to introduce our two speakers. Um, our first speaker, Dr. Monica Shaksbana is a medical anthropologist. She's a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and a senior scientist with the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at the Johns Hopkins University's Bloomberg School of Public Health. For over 20 years, she's conducted research on public health emergency management, focusing on community resilience, post-epidemic recovery, behaviorally realistic emergency plans, public engagement in disaster planning, and crisis and emergency risk communication. She's also worked diligently to translate scholarly research into actionable recommendations for policymakers and practitioners, including most recently as co-chair of the working group on reading populations for the COVID-19 vaccine, spotlighting vaccine access and acceptance issues. National advisory roles include Homeland Security Subcommittee of the Board of Scientific Counselors for the US Environmental Protection Agency and the Resilient America Roundtable of the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. Our second speaker, Dr. Ker Tara Kirksell, is a senior scholar also at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering, also at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. 
Dr. Sell's work focuses on improving public health policy and practice in order to reduce the health impacts of pandemics, disasters, and acts of terrorism. She's led studies on the development of policy responses to infectious disease outbreaks, community resilience to disasters, public health communication during the Zika outbreak, and misinformation during the 2014 Ebola outbreak. Leveraging over a decade of work in preparedness and response, she's recently focused much of her effort on COVID-19. One area she's worked extensively on is COVID-19 infodemic and understanding how to combat misinformation and disinformation during this pandemic. Effective and improved communications continue to have a critical role in combating the pandemic. And prior to her work in academia, she was a professional athlete and won a silver medal in the 2004 Olympics. We're thrilled to have both of them here today, and I'll hand it over now to Dr. Shock Spana. Great, thank you so much uh, for that um, uh, generous in introduction, Lauren, and I am pleased to speak with all of you here today. We're gonna tackle the topics of vaccine hesitancy and vaccine confidence. I am an anthropologist and I focus on the human side of vaccination. Um, I think you know through your own experiences that it's not enough to have a clinically successful vaccine. It also has to be socially acceptable. So I'm going to focus on the socially acceptable component. I know a lot of your questions in the Q&A, again, have a clinical focus, but I want to spotlight uh, the, the human factors uh, that vaccination raises. So just to give you a quick overview about what I'm going to tackle today, we're going to talk about that concept of vaccine hesitancy, uh, and we're seeing evidence of it in the United States. Uh, we're going to uh, define very formally what researchers and practitioners typically mean by the concept of vaccine hesitancy and the range of, of, of human uh, uh, phenomena that it includes. We will talk about major influences upon vaccine hesitancy. I'm going to give you two different models. Uh, they do speak to each other to try and understand um, from a larger framework perspective, what are those determinants shaping whether people are willing and able to be vaccinated. And then we'll conclude by going over some practical recommendations about how to tackle vaccine hesitancy, particularly in the context of COVID-19. What are we seeing right now? Well, let's call out the fact that COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic is a protracted crisis. It's going on and on and on. It's placed multiple stresses on the public, threat of illness and death, isolation vis-a-vis -vis distancing measures and uncertainties and hardships associated with disrupted economic activities. That's quite a selection of problems. And we do know, and we're seeing the fruits of Operation Warp Speed's efforts uh, to develop vaccines as swiftly as possible and along the way to inspire hope that relief for these types of problems I, I mentioned are coming. But despite the fact that vaccination is promising relief from many of the pandemic stresses, some Americans, including those most at risk of COVID-19 impacts, may actually miss out on or actively opt out of this life-preserving public health measure. So there's been a lot of polling done uh, for the last six plus months. So I'm, I'm gonna pull, pull out some of that polling um, just to, to touch on what concerns uh, Americans have about COVID-19 vaccines. So we had a, a survey done in early to mid September by the Pew Research Center. And at the top of most people's lists, uh, was concern about side effects and uncertainty around the effectiveness of a vaccine. Um, those were the most widely cited reasons by those who would not get a COVID-19 vaccine if one were available today. So there was also some sense that um, they wanted to take a wait and see stance. 
um, and see how things play out in terms of effectiveness and safety. Um, and then uh, less frequent, but still registering was a concern that perhaps I didn't need one, uh, some people thought, or perhaps costs would get in the way. Now, from that same survey, about a half of adults said they would definitely or probably get a vaccine to prevent COVID-19 if it were available today, that is in early to mid-September. But the, uh, there was nearly as many people who said that definitely or probably they would not get the vaccine. Um, what was a very big concern uh, was the dramatic rates in the intent to vaccinate as expressed in national polls um, that started in May and then uh, lasted through uh, September. And there was uh, a 21% percentage point drop. Um, and so that has been very, very concerning. Also of concern uh, as evidenced by the repeated polling is that groups at higher risk of COVID-19 impacts, in particular Black Americans, that there was uh, an expression of low rates of intent to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Now, that major drop in uh, uh, the intent to vaccination seems to be turning around. Um, and so we have data, for instance, from a Gallup poll that was conducted in late October, early November, um, as COVID-19 infections continue to increase across the United States. And so there's been an uptick in willingness uh, to take a COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccine. Um, you know, this, this poll, this Gallup poll um, indicated just as an aside that 37% of Americans who would not get a vaccine said that the rush timeline for the development of the vaccine was the main reason they would not be vaccinated. So there's, you know, as much uh, national reporting has indicated, um, some hesitancy that's tied up in the perceived um, quickness within the vaccine uh, being developed. So, okay, so we've got this kind of hesitation among a large number of, of Americans to uh, be vaccinated. So what, what do the experts mean by vaccine hesitancy? And so the formal definition is um, from the SAGE Working Group on Vaccine Hesitancy, um, that it's a delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccination despite avail availability of vaccination services. They also go on to say that this type of hesitancy is complex and context specific and that it varies across time, place, and vaccines. So there's no single reason, single overriding reason that uh, uh, each individual is uh, hesitating to be vaccinated. So it's really important to be uh, sensitive to the context in which people are deciding to vaccinate themselves or their loved ones. And it's helpful to think about vaccine acceptance uh, in terms of a continuum of, of, of behaviors. There is a small portion who say, I, am, I will refuse all vaccines. And it comes from a place of not trusting vaccines overall. Um, a larger, much larger proportion, however, are unsure, um, you know, they have a gut feeling that uh, they, don't want to be vaccinated, but they're not entirely ruling it out. Um, they're coming from the perspective of, I'm really not sure this is right for me or my child. Uh, some may accept uh, 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 some vaccines and not others. They may delay the uh, vaccination or they may refuse some. And again, for gut feelings, I don't really know. I really have doubts. Um, the, there are a number of people who are accept again, um, with, uh, with some doubts. Okay. I guess I'll vaccinate. And then you have the accept all vaccines. Okay. I'm ready to get vaccinated. 
the smallest uh, minority is the refuse all vac vaccines. Despite the representation of rampant vaccine hesitancy, the people who express a desire to refuse all vaccines is actually a small minority. And the okay, I'm ready uh, is, uh, or okay, um, I'll do it, but I'm not, you know, I may have some uh, reservations, but I'm gonna do it anyway. That is the vast majority of people uh, in the United States. So what are some reasons, uh, what are those factors that influence uh, vaccine acceptance? Um, and those researchers working on vaccine hesitancy uh, uh, pull out three major factors. Uh, this is called the three C's model. Um, so first, a uh, first factor is confidence. Um, you know, the trust in the effectiveness and safety of the vaccine, the system that delivers the vaccine, including the reliability and competence of health services and health professionals, and also the motivations of policymakers who decide on the needed vaccines. So that's a major factor. Complacency uh, also plays a role where perceived risks of vaccine preventable diseases are low and vaccination is not deemed a necessary preventive action. Um, so vaccines basically have been a, a, a victim of their own success where people become more concerned about potential side effects of a vaccine because uh, the environmental cues around them um, aren't showing a high prevalence of the disease or its impacts. Uh, so there's a sense of complacency. And then lastly, the third C is convenience. Uh, and, and this uh, speaks to issues of affordability and access. I'm not expecting you to, to read the, the detail on this second model, um, but since the three C's model, uh, vaccine researchers have worked to map the complex terrain of vaccine hesitancy. And an important takeaway here is that there is, again, no one reason for people's reluctance or aversion towards vaccination. And as researchers, practitioners, and policymakers, we must have our eyes wide open to the many complex and compounding contributors to vaccine hesitancy. Again, don't strain your eyes to read this model up close. I'll pull out the main branches uh, in the next few slides. So the first branch focuses on contextual influ influences, those bigger picture items uh, like historical relationships to medical and public institutions, social and cultural uh, trends, uh, environmental circumstances, uh, the, the quality and reliability of, of health systems, uh, and larger economic and political factors. Uh, there is a, an anthropologist named Dr. Eb Dubay, um, and she calls out uh, two main or broader cultural shifts that she says are affecting vaccination acceptance. These days, the first is a crisis of trust. That is people are following scientific recommendations less and less, and they have greater distrust of, of expert systems they perceive to be distant from them and unlike their own uh, social network. And then of crisis of truth, this increasing distrust overall in institutions of all kinds uh, and a decline in the influence of medical authorities. Um, beyond the bigger picture con con context are individual and social influences. Uh, and that is what people see happening around them in their own social networks, that sort of peer-to-peer -peer influence. Um, you know, as a, as, a grow as a child growing up, what did my parents teach me about the value of vaccination? Um, what relationship do I have with providers in the US health system? Um, 
is do I see immunization and do the people I, I trust see immunization as a, as a good thing uh, from a social norms perspective? Or do we tend to think of it as not really needed or uh, somehow harmful in some way? So I'll, I'll just call out a concrete example here, which is the HPV vaccine. And despite the clinical benefits of cervical cancer prevention, certain norms around sexual, sexual activities inhibited some parents from allowing their teens to be vaccinated against HPV. So here we see social norms and values making a difference. And, the net, you know, and then there are also very specific issues that are tied to the particular vaccine itself. Um, as we talked about, some people perceive uh, the COVID-19 vaccines as somehow unsafe because research development and manufacture have occurred on such an accelerated time frame. Uh, so that's very specific to COVID-19 uh, vaccines. Uh, in the case of the shingles vaccine, um, shortages, uh, periodic shortages have made it inconvenient for people to get vaccinated against shingles. Um, there, it, this is a two dose uh, vaccination schedule. And again, convenience issues uh, can affect people's willingness to get vaccinated the second time around. And certainly the uh, reactive, uh, their own reactions to the first uh, injection may uh, offset their willingness and interest in being vaccinated for the second dose. Just to conclude, given this very complex set of influences, what do we do to try and reduce vaccine hesitancy? Well, it's important to have our eyes wide open. And if there are signals of hesitancy around vaccines, we must early on try and understand those reasons and do not wait until uh, that hesitancy has reached a crisis proportion. Um, we also need to ensure that healthcare providers know and use immunization best practice uh, practices and also recognize their own impact on vaccine decision-making. Uh, research has shown over and over that uh, individuals are more willing to be vaccinated when that recommendation comes from a known and trusted healthcare uh, professional. We need to engage a variety of communicators and influencers to promote vaccination and making a, uh, and also make access easy uh, using locations uh, that are easy for people to go to and don't result in lost income um, should they have to take off work to get vaccinated. People sometimes need a little bit of, a little nudge um, whether it's a postal text or phone reminder, you know, just to keep vaccination top of mind. A lot is going on in everybody's lives. So sometimes it helps to just remind people the importance of, of getting vaccinated. Um, teaching children at a young age uh, through a variety of platforms about the importance of immunization. And also, again, reinforcing the important role of community protection. Um, uh, yes, it does uh, uh, help the individual, but also um, protects uh, the larger community. Uh, next slide, please. It's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Tara Kirksell, who's going to tackle issues of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Monica. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much um, for having me, and it's such a pleasure to, to present to this crowd. Um, I'm sure that everyone has seen um, misinformation or disinformation and is starting to realize that this is really a growing problem, um, especially nowadays. You know, people are isolated. They're anxious. Monica has mentioned this already, but, you know, they're politically and socially divided, economically stressed. This is such ripe ground for these misinformation and disinformation campaigns. And of course, we know that communication has not gone that well over the course of the response. So more problems there. Um, and, you know, at the same time, misinformation and disinformation um, is really coming from a range of sources. So we know it's coming from both domestic um, and 
foreign actors who are trying to sort of sow this discord and to, um, you know, further whatever sort of political or social goals they have. So we've seen, you know, personally, I've seen, I'm sure everyone has seen something different, but I've seen, you know, memes about the, you know, a potential uh, chimp virus vector making someone who takes the vaccine more animal light, like um, some concerns about safety and manufacturer immunity, uh, accusations of profiteering, anything and everything dealing with Bill Gates. It seems like um, anything that someone can pin on him, it, it seems to be a growing meme. Um, you know, that uh, vaccines being used to track people, that there are crisis actresses, um, or that the whole thing's a hoax. Now, I've just done something that um, I'm going to actually recommend that when you talk to um, people about misinformation, they believe um, that you don't do, which is to repeat the lie. Um, but this is just to provide um, sort of a little bit of a grounding on what's happening here. Um, and also, I hope that, you know, if we think of misinformation, similar to a virus that I hope that you guys are are pretty well inoculated um, based on your understanding of, of science, the health science around this. Um, but anyway, just to sort of, you know, come back to my presentation, you know, va vaccine misinformation has become more mainstream, is more normalized. These fringe groups are all getting together and all they need to do is inject doubt. So that's our problem here. But let's try to find a solution by approaching it first with empathy. So let's start to just think about, okay, why are people concerned? What kinds of things, what kind of factors really increase people's concerns about something like a vaccine? Well, if they don't really have any control over what's happening or what might happen, this really increases their concern. There's uncertainty. Um, you know, I don't know um, what, what's going on here. If, if they aren't quite sure, this is certainly something also that increases concern. If the risk is personal to, that, personal to them, right? Not not that it's some concern that's out there that might affect someone else, but that it might affect them. This is another thing that really increases perception of risk. If it's unfamiliar or new, if it's, you know, unnatural, something, you know, sort of created in a lab that also can cre increase concerns. If there's questionable benefit, if they're not quite sure what they're going to get out of it, or if there's poor trust in authorities, these things can also increase perceptions of risk. And so this, in this case, um, you know, these all kind of can come together around the vaccine um, to sort of, you know, make people start to think and question things. So, you know, thinking, okay, so here's where people are coming from. That can really help us start to relate and start to think of, you know, different ways to deal with this. Um, oh, before I get too far along, I did have this in here as a reminder, which of course I always forget, just to define misinformation and disinformation. So misinformation here um, is the uh, is, is information that's really false in the context of the scientific understanding of that time. Now, obviously, we learn more over time. It doesn't mean when we learn more, um, the things we said in the past were wrong. They were just, um, you know, uh, within the context of that time. So misinformation, when we say miss, they are, these are often the result of ignorance or poor understanding. But that is in contrast to disinformation, where people are doing this on purpose. They're purposely creating and disseminating these falsehoods. They know they're false. Um, and this is in the context also of scientific information of the time. All right, so here are some, you know, misinformation rumor types that we, my group has sort of um, separated uh, some of these rumors into. Um, you can't see me, but I am this person on the upper right. Um, I actually found myself in uh, my misinformation data set. Well, actually one of our analysts did, um, but, uh, it was, it was, you know, a very big surprise. Um, but we have false cures, um, you know, the miracle, uh, miracle mineral, mineral solution, or it's that kind of a form of bleach. Um, we've heard about that, you know, you've all heard about that. Um, you know, we have a list of different types of false cures, uh, like silver solution, all kinds of things. Um, we also have a lot of conspiracies, and these include that profiteering component. Um, for this one, we, we ran a coronavirus exercise um, in October, 2019. And of course people thought that that was some sort of nefarious planning thing. Um, scapegoating, um, where people are trying to sort of blame others for everything that's going on. Um, and then mischaracterizing dis the disease or protective measures. So, you know, this is where a lot of our vaccine mis disinformation comes in. I have an example here, people talking about, you know, leaf blowers possibly spreading COVID-19. So these are the types that I generally classify them into. You may have a different classification system, but this helps me sort of organize what's going on. 
So I just wanted to talk a little bit, of, you know, I have two slides about our research that from Ebola that can help us sort of frame what's happening. Um, the thing here, so we found misinformation in 10% of our tweets, but half of that was sort of this half true or misinterpreting the truth, right? So a lot of times when we see false information, um, it can be really hard to parse out. So it can be, it's mostly true. An example of this, someone saying there's a Ebola patient in Fairfax County Hospital and going to Canada, right? There was someone being evaluated for Ebola, but that person didn't have Ebola. Um, and so, you know, this is suggesting, um, you know, that there was Ebola there. Um, and this is sort of the type of thing that can be really hard for these platforms to sort of sort through and get rid of, um, but they provide the impression that, you know, that something's going on when something really isn't. Um, and that can be a really difficult piece of the battle. The other thing I wanna mention is that uh, misinformation and disinformation is often used to promote discord or provoke a response. Often it is a vehicle for a, a political piece, um, for a political message, uh, a social message. I mean, these are sort of it's, COVID is just there as the thing that people are reading about and the thing that people can talk about it's carrying another message along with it. So I just have a few here, lists, lists, I've listed out a few things here, some critical needs, right? Things that we probably aren't doing so well right now and need to do better on. So one of these is maintaining and building trust, right? Working with trusted community members, um, actually, uh, you know, trusted sources of information. You guys actually are an incredible source, source of trusted information. Um, being transparent here and collecting data and actually sharing it out. Um, this is incredibly important. Um, engaging with identity. So thinking about the values and core beliefs and affiliations of um, the people that we're trying to talk to, right? We're not trying to talk to people who are in the uh, public health echo chamber. We're trying to sort of um, you know, expand that message in ways that people can really hear it and accept it. it it's not just that people aren't getting this information or the inf or information about the vaccines, it's that it's not being provided in ways that they can really accept and absorb. And that's really a critical need. Um, we also need to sort of listen to what the concerns are and what personal priorities they relate to. People are telling us what they think is important. And sometimes I feel like we're ignoring it. Um, so sort of saying, okay, what do you need to hear that can help you understand um, what's happening with the vaccine? I also have um, communicating uncertainty here. This is a really big thing that we've struggled with communication overall on COVID-19, foreshadowing change, um, identifying what's known and unknown and what's being done to fill those gaps. These are things that um, you know, we really need to do well. And, and to say sometimes, you know, here are the things that we know, here are the ways that things have been tested for this vaccine, and here are the ways that we're collecting more information. Um, here, you know, here are the advent, uh, ad adverse event. Um, you know, data collection systems, these are the ways that we're trying to figure out more, uh, make sure that we know what's happening as it's happening. So I have a couple slides here too, about how to sort of deal with this people who people how to deal with misinformation. The first one is just dealing with people who believe false information. This is a more retail situation, right? You're talking to someone, you dealing with family, dealing with patients, um, you know, dealing with people face to face who you kind of want to get back on on your side, who you want to sort of understand what's going on and try to deal with that false information they, they, they believe. So first of all, of course, engage respectfully, right? Um, no one likes to just be, uh, you know, told that they're an idiot or something like that. Um, the other thing to do is connect so that, you know, you've made that connection. You say like, oh yes, I, I can understand. That is really a confusing part of this story. Um, to talk about the tactics, right? Uh, you know, what is it about that misinformation that's drawing people in? What about it? What about it makes it kind of clickbait? Does it sort of fall within the categories of misinformation that we've seen already? Um, the other thing to do is encourage verification to say, okay, well, let's talk about um, where we can see more, where we can see if that's actually true. And finally, to provide alternative information sources. Now, this can be a tricky thing because Sometimes people who believe false information are also not inclined to believe official sources. Um, and so, you know, trying to figure, to work with them to figure out what kind of sources are, are helpful to them um, can be a little bit tricky. So then if you come across false information online, this is a different, this is a different thing, right? You, um, 
you certainly don't want to repeat the lie, right? Don't quote tweet it. Um, don't sort of link to it and say, this is wrong because of X, because all you're doing is amplifying that lie. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, is just really hard to do, but it's something to get into the practice of. It's just, you know, talk about the truth. Don't talk about the lie. Um, and then the other thing is if you don't know the source um, and the source isn't legitimate, limit direct engagement. So, you know, it, just going back and forth with them isn't going to help you and only sort of elevates them. Um, report it to social media companies. Sometimes deplatforming can be helpful, um, but I think that's only sometimes. Um, and then also to provide to the true information, to focus on providing that. Uh, next slide. I think it's just the resource slide. So here are some resources. Um, I'll let Monica talk about some of these if she'd like. I put the last three on here. The CERC manual is a great resource. Um, if you want to look at risk perception, people who sort of have been discussing risk perception and risk communication, um, Cavello, Sandman, Slovic, these are great resources to sort of Google and look up. Um, and then just sit, looking at what Claire Wardle at First Draft is providing, um, she is a great resource. That's all I've got for you today. Thanks so much, Tara. And thanks to both of our speakers for um, a really interesting series of slides and, and starting this conversation. We have some great questions in the Q&A session. And actually, um, the slide you were just on uh, touches on one of the questions. Um, and maybe I'll ask both of you to elaborate very briefly. Uh, someone asked if there's a particular website or reference that you prefer that shows the safety of research on vaccines something that they could potentially use or link to on social media. So I think Tara, that was a great summary of some of the ones um, you prefer. Maybe I'll ask Monica the same. Um, I would recommend that uh, participants uh, in this webinar take a look at the National Institutes of, he National Institutes of Health SEAL initiative, and SEAL is C-E-A-L. It's the Community Engagement Alliance. And that NIH initiative has been serving to curate a variety of resources um, that uh, are uh, culturally competent uh, and scientifically accurate that do convey um, in a very digestible way ideas about uh, vaccine development, vaccine safety, uh, vaccine uh, effectiveness. So do try the uh, NIH's SEAL Alliance website. Great, thank you. Um, another question that came early in the session, uh, given the severe hesitancy of many vulnerable racial groups for the vaccine, how do we better engage with these communities to ensure trust is built for the vaccine? Um, uh, I'm happy to uh, start and then Tara, please uh, uh, join in. Um, there are several ways, or I guess several different types of interventions. And one is being cognizant of the historical trauma that uh, a diversity of communities of color have experienced in the United States with regard to medical and public health professionals and institutions. So much of the vaccine hesitancy and a larger sense of fear about interactions with um, public health and health systems is tied up in that history. Um, and there are, are really good uh, historical accounts and I'm sure most people on, on, on this webinar are familiar with the Tuskegee Initiative. but. The, the, the actionable recommendation about this to deal with historical trauma is really listening to people and validating their sense uh, of, of mistrust and their fear. Um, there is a real history there. Uh, this is not some perceived slight. And I think acknowledging at the outset of a, of a, of a conversation that there have been abuses in saying, I know you have very good reasons not to trust public health or health systems. And I, I, I feel for that. Um, so I think you have to validate the emotional side to people's vaccine hesitancy. 
Um, other actionable recommendations are um, involvement. I think as Tara pointed out, it really does matter. It's not just the content of a message and those messages really should be culturally competent and personally relevant at the same time that they're scientifically accurate. They have to be delivered by individuals that have um, grounding and uh, pre-existing trust uh, within a community. Um, so the more that uh, health systems and public health departments are enabling uh, practitioners of color, for instance, to deliver messages to uh, individuals within communities of color, there will be less hesitancy. Um, so involvement and information. And then lastly, um, for those of you who may be decision makers or involved in vac vac COVID-19 vaccination op operations, we cannot think about COVID-19 vaccine or vaccination as a one-off public health intervention to end the pandemic. It is that, but it's much more than that. Um, communities of color have been both financially and physically hard hit by the pandemic. So um, I know that uh, there are many advocates who are arguing for the need to involve community health workers that are very much grounded in communities of color and, and engage them as allies in uh, the vaccine uh, delivery and communication systems that um, are now being built up and operationalized. So those are just some concrete things. Tara, you may have um, additional things from a misinformation and disinformation perspective. No, I, I think in this situation, this is about um, good communication practices and I think you've covered them. Great, thanks. Um, you know, Monica, your comment early makes me think about some of the work we've been doing in disaster preparedness to ensure that um, vulnerable communities are incorporated in the planning processes so that we don't have, um, or we reduce the likelihood of blind, spot, blind spots in planning um, to ensure that, that, that the people who we're planning for are well represented in the dialogue. And we have a um, related question uh, do you think the effective uh, an effective strategy we could take would be to highlight members of their community who helped to develop the vaccine, not just leaders and CEOs, but working class lab workers, nurses giving vaccines to volunteers, all members of their community? Is there any research into this kind of approach that dispels a crisis of trust that we have now? I think that's an excellent suggestion. I, I can't call out a specific uh, research study in particular, but my professional judgment is the more that we represent vaccination as a collective good uh, in which a variety of professionals, um, everyday folks and everybody in between uh, has had a hand um, and the more we promote collective ownership over vaccination, the better. So to highlight, for instance, um, people of color who have enrolled in the clinical trials, uh, researchers of color who have been involved in the development, research and development of, of, of vaccines is important. All, all um, types of workers who are involved in um, the delivery and the administration of vaccines. I think the more we represent the vaccination enterprise as a whole, as reflecting uh, the demographics of the United States, uh, the better. Um, the more that people see themselves in the vaccination enterprise overall, the better. Um, and that way it won't be perceived as somehow of a something of a top-down uh, uh, exercise, um, but it is actually owned by uh, communities as a whole. Um, and again, um, that's more of a, a professional judgment um, based on a variety of inputs. Thank you. Um, there's 
quite a few questions on the FDA emergency use authorization mechanism and how to talk about um, getting a vaccine that's not FDA approved, but um, using the FDA emergency use authorization. Personally, I've seen a lot of, um, I would say it's likely misinformation about what the emergency use authorization means versus um, FDA approval. Maybe uh, Tara, could you touch on a little bit about how you sort of manage this conversation around what what emergency use authorization really is and and um, how we communicate that to ensure that people the people we're talking to really understand the differences. Yeah, so this is a really sort of complicated area. And, you know, if people want to go into the specific details, like, uh, you know, in a conversation or whatever, um, I think that's that's really great. But I, I think the, the most important thing to do here is to sort of emphasize um, sort of what's been done to sort of ensure safety and efficacy so far um, and what other things are being done to collect that information, um, you know, as we go forward, that it's not just, you know, we're not going to sort of monitor the public health and, 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 you know, everyone who's getting this vaccine, that they're not going to be monitoring what's going on going forward, um, but that their additional collection of information that, you know, you know, if something starts to come up, um, that, um, you know, that's going to be monitored and um, reviewed, I think it's important just to say, you know, here are the, here are the reasons why we think it's safe. The FDA has reviewed this data um, and, you know, has come to the conclusion it's safe and effective. Um, and here are some of the, some of the things that we're also doing in addition to that to continue to monitor along the way. I think that's the way to answer those questions. Um, I do think that, you know, it is pretty complex when it comes to sort of approval versus authorization. Um, and, and, you know, some of that's just in the weeds. If you have someone who wants to get into the weeds on that, then, you know, yeah, go into detail. But I think right now it's sort of stick to those top line, you know, here's what we know, here's what we're, we're doing to find out more information um, is, is the best thing to do. And we have a related question to that, which is talking about the sort of rich discourse around what is known and what is not currently known about these vaccines. And, and I think this is a theme that certainly we've been talking about through this whole pandemic is how do you have a conversation about what's known and what's not with patients and the public to ensure that you're building or rebuilding trust and, and modeling transparency uh, without, you know, how this differs from infusing doubt into the conversation. How do you talk about what's known and what's not known? Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, I emphasize that transparency is key in some people, in some, some polling, um, has said like, you know, as mentioned, people don't like to hear about uncertainty because they, they, they make some question, but you know, all of the, the science that we've seen on, on risk communication so far has, has emphasized that if you, people think you've lied to them, then you've lost them for good. Um, and so, you know, when there are things that we don't know, I think it's important to say that. Um, and so we know that, you know, when we, these, these, um, these vaccines have been, um, tested amongst, you know, tens of thousands of people. Uh, they have a good safety profile, although there probably will be some, um, you know, some people won't feel so good after they've taken the vaccine. Um, but that, you know, overall, they are, are, they seem very safe, and they seem to be, um, and they seem to be uh, also very effective. Um, and so, uh, you know, being transparent, though, about saying you're, you're probably not going to feel good, and that we're also co collecting information um, and, you know, but saying with confidence that this is something, you know, that is, is something that, you know, you would take um, or have taken. I think that that's the other critical thing. You know, if, if you guys are, if everyone is in the front line and is taking it, emphasize, you know, that personal, you know, we talked about at the beginning that it's very um, important to talk about the personal aspects um, of things that concern people. And so, you know, it's nothing can be more personal than, you know, you already having um, had it. And so I think that that's another thing to talk about. Great, thank you. Um, a question that came up in um, in some that, that a few people posted when registering is, um, can providers or clinicians who don't want to discuss their personal decision-making around COVID vaccination still be advocates for vaccination? Um, I think we've seen this a lot, you know, these first pictures coming in um, from healthcare workers and frontline uh, workers getting vaccinated. And it's incredibly important. Um, Monica, as you were noting before, 
And um, when Nancy Massonier gave a fireside chat the other day, she said that um, really she believes that people's primary care physicians, people's, uh, you know, day-to-day healthcare workers that they interact with are going to be the people that are most likely to convince the broader public to uh, get vaccinated. So um, I think this question is really timely. How do providers or clinicians who aren't necessarily comfortable sharing their own personal decisions around vaccines still advocate for vac- advocate for vaccinations more broadly, or how do they, you know, delicately abstain from that conversation in general? Well, um, I think that uh, healthcare personnel of of all stripes um, do understand the influence they have in terms of uh, of recommendations uh, around uh, a particular preventative or or treatment, uh, and the vaccine confidence literature does show again and again that people more likely to be vaccinated. Uh, if, if that is recommended uh, by a provider who is familiar to them. So there's two dimensions. There's, there's the trust factor, the pre-established trusting relationship, and then also the fact that the um, authoritative medical knowledge is being deployed uh, and shared for the, for the patient's uh, well-being. Um, I, I think that healthcare personnel um, can be advocates and champions of, of COVID-19 and other, other uh, forms of vaccination uh, without getting into necessarily their own set of uh, mores and social values. Um, and I'll defer to best practices and um, professional ethics that are governing healthcare personnel in general. But I think that there is a way to practice um, or provide healthcare uh, in the interest of resolving uh, the pandemic and meeting the needs of patients without uh, engaging in um, this is what I think or this is what I believe. Um, There are ways to there are ways to handle that conversation without a provider or other uh, uh, healthcare worker personalizing it. Um, uh, Tara, any any hints or tips um, that you can bring to the table? Oh, I think that you've covered. I mean, this is a sticky situation, um, and so um, you know it is something that requires delicacy. And I think um, you know Monica has sort of pointed those those concepts out. Yeah, uh, you know I. If, if there are hesitations, and I, we haven't really talked about that, which is hesitation, uh, vaccine hesitancy up among healthcare personnel, um, because again, uh, the confidence around COVID-19 vaccinations is going up, but there are still significant levels of reluctance expressed by a variety of healthcare personnel. Um, and that maps onto the larger demographics of the uh, U.S. public. So for, um, for individuals who come from a uh, racial and ethnic minority of background and are working in the health sector, you, do st- still, you still also see some uh, lower rates of hesitancy in comparison to uh, their white counterparts. Um, so there's a lot, there's an intersection here. And so health systems really do need to listen to all sectors of their workforce and understand people's different um, concerns, hopes, and aspirations around uh, COVID-19 vaccination. So apart from all the polling that's being done of the U.S population writ large, health systems really need to be talking to their own employees of all, of all kinds about where they see vaccination fitting into their personal and institutional and communal well-being. We have a, um, a sort of related question about the opposite pull of wanting to message that the trusted community members are willing to receive vaccination. 
Um, and the example given is like showing the picture of a hospital CEO getting the vaccine um, and how you balance that with the potential worry that people will be angry that people in power who not, aren't necessarily frontline workers are jumping the line. Yeah, I, I think there, there is a balance there. Um, there is a lot of skepticism right now um, with certain court in certain quarters that people who have economic, political and or social pull are somehow going to jump to the head of the queue. Um, we do have a country of have and have nots. So people have concrete reasons to be worried. The more specific and concrete evidence, however, that health systems and health departments can show to the wider population that allocation is happening in a fair and equitable way, the better. Um, you know, is, is, is the hospital CEO over 65 and does he or she have a, you know, a coexisting um, condition that would raise his or him up to a higher tier in terms of the allocation framework? Um, I think we have to be sensitive to, to, to um, both aspects. We have one, I'll just ask one additional question, um, maybe for Tara is, is, you know, how do you talk to kids and teenagers when they bring home or ask about misinformation? Um, whether it's sort of assessing for yourself, whether that information is accurate or inappropriate, or, and then how do you sort of correct that potential for misinformation? Yeah, I think this is an opportunity to really sort of model the ways that, you know, we want people, every, we sh everyone should sort of um, think through information that they're getting, right? This is a good teaching experience, in fact, um, to say, okay, well, what's the source of this information? What are, what is it, what is actually being said to break it apart and see, you know, well, what are the reasons why someone might say that to go looking for, um, you know, those, those other uh, sort of ways to verify what's been said um, in a non-biased way um, and to um, sort of look and, and identify, help your, your kids or, or, or you know, the, the child you're talking to, um, you know, figure out how to find um, accurate sources. Um, this is something that actually I've been, um, you know, uh, I, something I think is really important is to increase digital literacy. Um, and it, it's not just kids, actually, it's everyone. Um, but this is such an important part because, you know, if you th again think of um, misinformation and disinformation and sort of the pathogen sense, um, having people able to understand how to um, identify what is true and what isn't. And I'm not saying provide, you know, tell them, oh, you know, some certain news source is always right and some certain news source is, is not. Um, I think it's the, just the process and the techniques used to sort through information. Um, I think that this is an incredibly important thing to sort of inoculate people um, against um, false information that they may receive later on in life. Um, and so these are good practices to start early. And I think this is a good example of a way to do it. Great, thank you so much. And thank you both for um, this incredible dialogue. I think it's really important. And um, I, I can speak for myself and hopefully everyone else that we've learned a lot today. Um, Thank you all for the incredibly thoughtful questions that have been posted in the chat. There's so many um, and we appreciate the voting. We'll use that to prioritize some of the Q and A's that we're doing um, coming up and we'll be putting those on the NeTech website as well. I'll just remind you that, um, that the NeTech website is here. And if you have any additional questions, um, whether it's for our SMEs or for NeTech generally, the, the email address is right there. Uh, we appreciate all the time you've spent with us today, and we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you all so much, and a special thank you to our speakers as well.